thank him for this opportunity uh, to share uh, some of the things that uh, we've been looking at here at Yale. And so I'm going to be talking now about ultrasound evaluation of carotid plaque as well as intima medial thickness. And the objectives for this lecture are first to describe the ultrasound technique for evaluation of carotid plaque. I'm going to discuss the clinical significance of certain sonographic characteristics of carotid plaque. We'll describe the pitfalls in the sonographic evaluation of carotid plaque. And then lastly, discuss the clinical significance and technique for measuring the intima medial thickness. And really, I think we should start off the lecture by asking the question as to why should you evaluate carotid plaque? And the reason for this is that most strokes are caused by emboli. And the risk of embolization is directly related to plaque composition and indirectly related to the degree of stenosis, which is what we usually measure with uh, carotid ultrasound. And I think evaluation of plaque is kind of a forgotten part of the ultrasound examination, but actually of all the things that we do, it is what is most directly related to the risk of embolization and therefore to the risk of stroke. So let's talk a little bit about how plaque forms to begin with. Uh, no one knows for sure, but likely plaque formation begins as a result of damage to the endothelial cells, specifically lipid and cholesterol uh, deposition and or hypoxia. Uh, this results in uh, increased permeability of the endothelial lining as well as leukocyte migration, which prompts an inflammatory cell response and the inflammatory cells then uh, phagocytize the lipids and cholesterol in the plaque, resulting in the formation of, form cell, of foam cells. Now, these foam cells tend to be a little bit unstable, and they tend to die and form a necrotic core. And all of these things uh, result in a migration of smooth muscle cells into the wall of the vessel. What happens then is that you have a combination of these smooth muscle cells in the wall, the inflammatory cells in the wall, as well as these necrotic foam, site, foam cells. And this results in reactive physiologic compensation causing thickening of the IMT, which leads to further hypoxia. And a combination of all of these factors that result in hypoxia stimulate the release of angiogenic growth factors which result in a proliferation of the adventitial vasovasorum, as well as intraplaque neovascularity. And these new small vessels within the plaque uh, undergo repeated cycles of hemorrhage followed by fibrosis. And this kind of continues in a cyclical uh, fashion, resulting ultimately in a necrotic core. Now, in the meantime, the plaque has a thin fibrous cap, and as the plaque underneath it uh, swells due to the hemorrhage and then shrinks again because of the fibrosis, this fibrous cap starts to thin. And ultimately, what causes the stroke, uh, as you see in the schematic here that I borrowed from the New England Journal of Medicine, is that that thin fibrous cap will ultimately rupture. And this exposes the necrotic core uh, comprised of the lipids and the cholesterol and the necrotic foam cells uh, to the uh, blood that uh, flows over the plaque. And this necrotic core is very thrombogenic. And what happens is that thrombus forms on the top of the uh, thin fibrous cap at the site of the rupture. And it's actually that thrombus that is unstable that gets knocked off by the blood that's flowing over the plaque and results in the distal embolization and the stroke. So ultimately, the risk of rupture of the plaque and the formation of the thrombus